We went to Shrewsbury yesterday with the uh, vocal evening townsmen and girls. And uh, oh, the countryside was magnificent. Oh, it was beautiful. There was every shade of green. You couldn't, I didn't know there were so many shades of green. And the little lamb. <laughs> It seems to me that, uh, that nobody can really afford to run a stately home nowadays. We might as well have some stately cottages. But I go far on that. I say what we need now are not so much stately homes, but stately minds. Stately minds. That's one of my favourite phrases, the stately minds. Well, maybe a lot of it is because with no father, it might be that, and... But still, he's the only one in the family that's ever done it. Oh, what was the last lot he did? Was it three pounds you stole and spent it? And I mean, there's no need to do it. He gets, uh, he, he goes to the pictures, they get sweets, and they get plenty of fruit, don't you? They kept short of nothing, and got a TV put in for them. There's nothing the more I can give them. I was going on the road one day, just on my old solitary tin pot way, when suddenly round the corner come the flying squad. The usual chatter, they turned round and said, well, give an account of your movements. I said, I've been to London, Sheffield, Nottingham, Newcastle, Birkenhead, Seacombe, Liverpool, Brighton, Huddersfield, Halifax, Barnsley, Wakefield, Norman and Pontefract. Blackheat and Dumfries, Falkirk, Dundee, Tran and Dumbarton, Scotland, Murphy, Tiddle, Pontefract, Aberdeer, Cardiff City, Wrexham and Bristol, well, he says, hold on a bit, lad, have had enough. He was puzzled with the detective. I don't think they're much interested in anything outside their own lives. I think if I got a job and settle down, and get myself tidied up, some nice clothes, I think my wife would have me back tomorrow. I was talking to a fellow the other week. He'd just come from Africa. He'd been away on a ship. And he tells me that there was over six million huts to let in Africa. There's that many Africans over here. I've dreamed about going to New Zealand, he said, and I'm going. 
And I called him for everything. I said I'd never speak to him again, simply because, like, without my hubby be, being so ill, I mean, the, the boy was his sun, moon and stars. But I'm proud of him now. And, as, and I say, if anybody emigrates, it takes guts to do it. And that's why I wouldn't go to New Zealand, because I don't think I've got the guts to do it. <laughs> should a man work when he has the health and strength to lie in bed? shouted you this morning. I've always slept a bit myself. Now look, it's quarter to eight by the right time. That clock's not past this morning, you know. Oh, Bernard, come on, son, hurry up. You know you've about quarter an hour's walk to school. Johnny, do you want any more before you go? You sure? <laughs> And I like a sailor with nice curly hair. Oh gee, I love him, I can't deny it. I'll be with him wherever he goes. He stands on the corner and whistles me out. He shouts to me, we are you coming out? Oh gee, I love him, I can't deny it. I'll be with him wherever he goes. He bought me a shawl of red, white and blue. And when we got married, he tore it in two. Oh, gee, I love him, I can't deny it. I'll be with him wherever he goes. <laughs> No idea that we live. I fancy five of us in one bed. Five of us. I mean, mother used to be trying to cover us, you know, and she'd have our coats on us, you know, and the night men would come and knock at the door. And if that man found three of us in that bed, my mother was brought to the court and found five shillings. And you'd, okay. have, to, you'd have to go out in the backyard in, in the shivering cold and sit in the lavatory till he went. The good old days. There was no good old days. I 
fully think myself that education is the finest thing that ever a man could have. I've often said it, his brains and my talent could go a long way, if you follow me mainly. Take her by the water, give her a kiss and make her cry. She's the old man's daughter. He's going up her feet like I went over the snow. On a Christmas morning, there was a van used to come round. He used to call it Father Christmas. I don't know the Methodist or Wesleyans. I can't tell you which. It belonged to um, Central Hall. I think they were Quakers or something. They used to come round on a Christmas morning with a van. And they'd give each little child a little underwear and a little penny and a doll. And that's all them children ever got. There was no Santa Claus. The no stockings. You don't think I can live on the dole at two pound a week, do you? And pay a big fat Irish landlady three pound ten board and lodge? Where's my beer money and cigarette money coming from? Where's my harem? We all stand on the corner again before long, woman a fag. You can see the sky through it. Sky, yes, the sky right through. We've no electric light whatever. And the town hall tell me I must pay for it myself. My chimney stack was demolished on the 5th of November, 1957. 
Oh, well, I've got cats there. I've got two cats, a big one and a kitten. The big ones run out with fright and left me with the little one, and that's no good. Big one won't stay, it goes out. Even the cats are afraid to stay in the bloody house, and yet we've got to stay here. And the cockroaches, well, till lately, they've been eating us alive. Go to the next door but one, and look up to the roof, and you see a big manhole in the roof where they've got to go for the policeman the other night to get the little baby out, because the ceiling was falling on and killing it. You see that cat? Well, the damn rat's done that to his ear. Only yesterday, the roof, it steamed in and steamed in, and just weary and fed up with it. It's just me and my sister, two on her own. I'm 61 and she's 57, and I think it's downright shame that we should live under these conditions. I asked him like about a job and uh, they were draining and that with pipes and that, you know, picking the sewerage up. He says, what can you do? I says, night watching. He says, can you wheel a barrel? I said, yes. He says, can you go back to the mixer and use a shovel? I said, I think I can. And he told me, he says, what are you betrayed? I said, I'm a labourer. So after he'd weighed me up from top to toe, Mr Finnegan turned round and said, oh, he said, as much as I admire your pluck, he says, you're too light for every work and you're too heavy for light work. I said, I'm neither use nor ornament, so I walked out there. Now, that's one of my uh, best pastimes at the public library. Get in there and see the old cronies, the one-time empire builders, trying to do the same as me live on uh, less than three pound a week. Now, I must speak the truth. I wasn't satisfied with my condition in life. I wasn't satisfied with my own class, really. I wanted to be in a class a little higher intellectually. The class I belong is the uh, higher working class. The lower working class, well, they are the animal class, actually, absolutely. They can talk on nothing. They are absolutely illiterate. Drink, drink, drink. <laughs>
the opposition leader of the Liberal Party and Lord Chancellor and the Speaker, the High Commissioners, the representatives of the services. They stand before the Cenotaph and we await the notes of Big Ben to announce the silence. I'd gone to work on the Tuesday morning and a big envelope came. So I opened this envelope, which I shouldn't have done, but I did do. And it was his papers to report to Aston Underline. So I said to the oldest son, I said, don't go to school this morning. I said, Joe, you better take this letter down. Oh, he says, I'm not missing school. I said, you'll do as you were told. You'll take this letter down to the warehouse. Then I'll see your father. So he went. So he come back, he said, how did you go on? Oh, he said, uh, it's his mobilisation papers, my dad is going away to the war. He said he'd be home soon, but he didn't come home soon. They all landed into Tommy Duck's round the corner. So anyhow, I'll tell you about uh, half past one, no, they rolled in six of them with a great big gallon jar of beer drunk. So of course, I didn't know the taste of drink. And I said, oh, you have to come home in a nice state, I said. So one of them said, oh, well, there, man, ma. He says, we'll uh, not see you for a long time after, he said. Well, anyhow, I'll tell you, they, he had a few hours sleep and they all went home. And at night time, they come again and they adjourned to a singing room here. So I said, oh, don't go out and get any more drink. I said, you've had enough today. You know, but well, you've got to go away tonight. Oh, he says, oh, get there some road rubber. Well, anyhow, they went. And they took bottles of beer with them to the station. And he said, now, Mary, he says, if you have a little girl, call it Margaret. And if it's a little boy, call it Stephen. I said, all right. So he kissed us and he went away. And we never seen him after he was killed at... I got notice to say he'd been killed. It was a four days back, but he was killed, it seems, on the 12th March, New Chapel. So they, uh... The wind stirs the leaves and, and the flags of the cenotaph as slowly these tributes grow at the very foot of the cenotaph. There are many wreaths to be laid this morning. So Mad said to me she thought that the budgie was egg bound and I said well we'll have to do something about it because it'll die if we don't. I said have you got a book on budgie? She said no. So she sent the boy out to buy a book and we did what we could for it. So she rang me up the next day, told me there was no eggs, rang me up the next day no eggs. So I said to her well you, you'd better take it to the university and have it seen to there. So she said, oh, I can't do that. She said, it says in the budgie book, you've got to keep them in the one heat. If I take it out in the cold, it'll get pneumonia and die. So anyway, she got a vet in to have a look at it. And Shep, the dog, followed her in. And uh, he goes to the cage to get the budgie out, opens the cage, the budgie flies out, alights on the mat, the dog jumps on it, and no budgie. He picks it up, the vet, looks at it, he said, this budgie's not egg-bound. He said, it's got a tumour. And with that, he just threw it in the fire. So Madge says, good heavens, she says, my lads will go mad. What did you do that for? He said, well, cremation is the most hygienic thing, madam. That will be seven and six. <laughs> <laughs> Put it out in the oh. So I started to speak to her and I said, um, 
I suppose you're wondering why I'm uh, reading my Bible in here. She said, well, it, it did seem a bit... Uh, yeah. You won't carry the can back, but I've got to carry the can back. But I'm not carrying the can back for no... Chalk, chalk, chalk. I love to listen to it. Go round in the mornings, down the street, yup, yup, yup. Oh, People say to me, big hearted beer. You won't carry the can back, I've but I've got the delight all by But life. I'm not carrying the can back for no one. The chalk, landlord chalk. came up and I love to listen day, to it. The old attitude of everybody as you were finished. You were too old. Go, go, go. I would have liked to have worked down, but that threw me out. <laughs> because I was old. It's a sin to grow old, you know. We had an old lady here, and um, she, everybody would run and get her a cup of tea and they'd wait on her and do all those little things, but she'd always say, Nobody wants me. Well, I mean, if you take that attitude, you can't expect anyone to want you, can you? I could take a pound out this morning, lay it out, and I wouldn't see anything for it. Look at the price of your butter. Why, we got the best butter when I was a girl at eightpence a pound, and the best roly bacon at sixpence. Twenty-four eggs for a shilling. Two pounds of sugar. A pound of margarine. And I think I'll take a pound of cooking fat and a bit short. How long have people I been having good material things? How long? They haven't had it above, what, 20, 30 years. This release from sheer anxiety about where the next meal was coming from. If, when the pressure is lifted, they should go a bit daft for 10 minutes, Who's to blame? And who's to wonder at it? abomination and water. Dead and wounded were lying about, and as I lay there, a voice alongside me said, Look, Murphy, there's a little buttercup. I said, Well, what about it? But that must be the good seed, fallen on the good ground. We must be the bad seed, fallen on the rock. And my dad used to go away to sea, like, and it was very hard for my mother, you know. Used to have a beating for nothing. She was a very hard working woman. And um, when he come home from sea, all the money would go over the county. And then, of course, my mother died on Christmas Eve. And she left me 14. A little baby, 12 months old. And another one there, uh, four. My dad stayed with us eight weeks. And then he got a ship and went away and left us. So he, of course, he died after, you know. Then I had more trouble on my plate, like my husband never ever got much, really. And I've had to work all my life. 
Well, thank God. God's been very good to me and his holy mother. It's a bit of a browsy life, checking it all around from top to toe. I was a big baby, and I was a fat little girl, a fat school girl, a fat young woman, and now I'm a fat old woman. <laughs> Happy days. But we're all part of, of a great mass. This great mass is just split up into little bits. We're the little bits. I'm part of you, you're part of me. The agony of our time is this overhanging threat. What can you say about that? The overhanging threat to the atomic bomb 